to worship the Lord through song this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand if you want to. If you don't feel like it, I totally understand. I'm there with you, bad legs and all. So we're going to start off this morning with a song entitled Build My Life.
And I'm going to read you a verse out of John chapter 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, if anyone serves me, he must follow me, follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. Who will you follow? Who are you following? Who are you serving? Because we can't follow without serving and we can't serve without following. And it says there that when we do that, we'll be where Jesus is. For where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so we ask ourselves a question this morning. Who will we follow? Who are we following? And the truth of the passage here is that the true servant serves where God is working. Well, actually he brought that truth back to us and set it before us and we're truth. A true servant of God follows him and then is able to serve him in his power where he is working with his spirit. Now that's what I desire for this church and I know that that's what many of you desire. And so to do that, we have to do what? To serve him, we have to follow him. Follow him. So let's pray together. Our God, we come with the privilege of worship today and with the fruit of praise on our lips. I thank you for who you are. I thank you, God, for what you've done. I thank you that you never change for your promises. God, that you hold us in your hand. And Lord, that you are going to finish what you, or complete what you began. And I thank you for that. Now I pray, thanking you for answered prayer, not just in the life of Keith, but many others here in the church today. I thank you, God, that you hear, that you care, and that by prayer, Lord, when we come before you, when we come before you in the righteousness of Christ, God, the hands of heaven are moved, the hands of God are moved. And I thank you for that. Now we come today, we lift up more praises to you. I ask God that our focus will be upon you. And I come and I praise you, Jesus. Praise you for being our Savior. In your name, amen. Let's sing together, Hosea. Oh, 
someone we can take everything to. Amen. It covers us in all of our trials, everything that we go through, we can rely on Him. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. This time we would only take our offering, but for now, uh, we're still just going to do that either online. You can bring it up to the church office, you can lay it in the offering plates, or you can mail your offering in. So, in conjunction with the songs we just sang, I want to do a song that everybody's familiar with for a special, and that is, His Eye is on the Sparrow. <laughs> Thank you. 
has been increased more than more and more. And the powers of hell have been unleashed, if you will, unleashed. And now they just openly rage. Now, our enemy knows the end of the book because he's read it. He's read the end of the book and he know, knows that the God who wrote this book is a God who cannot lie and will keep his word. And so, he is busy. He is busy. Busy doing what? Gathering his harvest, the souls of men for hell. Those who have not grasped his grace and accepted his grace. Now, I'm not talking about the lost anymore. I'm talking about us. I'm talking about those who have been saved. You see, even as believers, even as those who have been saved by his grace, and those who are being kept by his grace, we have to live by his grace. Live by, living by grace. You see, when we stand before our enemy Satan, we don't stand before him helpless, but we do stand before him in our power, hopeless, hopeless. In our own strength and in our own power, we fail. We always fail. But it is only through the power of God's grace in our lives, working the God who gave us grace, God who's keeping us by grace, he now gives us the power to live by grace, to live by grace. I believe that that is a very overlooked fact in the life of the church today, today and in the life of believers. We're willing to say, yes, I, I believe God saved me by grace, and I believe that I'm going to be in heaven one day and kept for all of eternity. But what about right now today? Are you, am I, are we living by grace? Living by grace because it's part of what God has done for us. You see, it's only God's grace that frees us from the power of sin and from the eternal sentence of undying death and hell. And it is grace that God has given us for salvation. He's kept us by grace and is keeping us by grace. But he's given us grace to live by, to live by. And so often we put that to the side. We don't think it's important. It is extremely important. It is the key to being able to have a victorious Christian life, to live by grace. Now we have to learn that, and it's a process, but we can't ignore it. You see, today I want to focus on this facet, this facet of grace, the grace to live by. You go into 1 Peter 4, 10, and it talks about there, the manifold grace of God. The man, that means different layers, different layers, different parts of grace. It's like a diamond. A diamond has different facets to it. You look at it, and then it turns a little bit, and you see another uh, glimmer. You see another truth. You see the beauty of the diamond. While it's still the same diamond, there is a different facet to it. And today I want to focus on that, on this diamond that we have. It's called grace, grace, grace. Now, we've talked about before living by grace. Last week I preached on that. I'm going to continue it this week because last week we looked at, we've been and adopted by grace, adopted by grace. We've been accepted by grace. And today, I want us to focus on we advance by grace. In our lives, we grow in grace and being able to apply it and make, being able to express it to others. And we have to advance in grace. You see the first two, they're all of God. Adopted by God, accepted by God, it's all of God. But advancing in grace is both God and us. God and us. We think, well, God, just do this in my life. Just do this. And God's saying, we will do it. And I will help you. But we can't separate our responsibility from the rights that we have and from the God that gave them to us. Now, I want you to turn, if you will, to Galatians. While the primary text in Ephesians 2, I want to look at something in the book of Galatians that brings this point home that we are to advance by grace. Galatians chapter 1. You say, well, why would you go to Galatians? Well, it is another part of Scripture that tells the truth that we can only advance by grace. And it is also...
deeply connected to Ephesians, and I'll show you that in just a moment. You see, Galatians 1, 1 through 3, I'm going to look at several passages, so read them in your Bible. Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who were with me to the churches of Galatia. Paul's introducing himself, and he's saying, these are the words of God, moved by the Holy Spirit, inspired by him. Verse number three, grace to you, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He's saying, remember the grace that you've received. Remember the peace that God gave you. Now verse 6. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him. To desert Jesus is to desert grace. To desert grace is to desert Jesus. Who called you by the grace of Christ for what? A different gospel. A different gospel. Which is really not another only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, a gospel of what? A grace contrary to what we have preached to you. He is accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now. If a man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Go to chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God. I do not nullify, I do not cancel the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Needlessly. Paul said, I have not forsaken grace. Chapter 3 verse 10 and 11 This is the gospel that they have exchanged for the gospel of grace and that's a gospel of good works or legalism. He says for as many as are the works of the law are under a curse for it is written cursed is the one who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. In other words, you want to live by the law? That if you break one law at all, every one time in your life, you are cursed. Now, for those that are lost, it means cursed unless they receive Christ. For those who believe and have received Christ, it means cursed as far as all of the blessings being withheld from us that God desires for us, it comes through grace. Verse 11. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. For the righteous man shall live by faith. Now go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 9. But now you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. How is it that you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental things? To which you desire to be enslaved all over again? You observe days and months and seasons and years. Paul is saying it is not by your works that you are saved. Look at one more verse, chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 1. It was for what? Freedom. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject, subject again to a yoke of slavery. Now, listen carefully to what I'm going to say. A Christian is a Christian because he is rightly related to God the Father through Jesus the Son and the work that he did on Calvary. But he that is a spiritual man is rightly related to the Spirit of God and not the law. Rightly related to the Spirit of God. He's leading us. He's teaching us. We're rejecting everything that does not come from God. And that can be 
verified by the Word of God and what the Spirit says. And if we are uh, wondering, God, is this you speaking? Verify it in the Word of God. Continue in prayer. But the truth of the matter is, a Christian is a Christian because he is rightly related to Jesus. But he, a man that is spiritual, is rightly related to the Spirit of God. You see, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He empowers us to live by grace. He gave us the Spirit in order that we might live by grace. Not walk away from the gospel, but accept the grace and recognize the grace, submit to the grace which comes from the Spirit of God. Now, I want to talk about what grace does for just a moment, and then I'll move on. Grace brings unity. Grace brings unity. When there's a vision, whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a business, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a nation, it doesn't matter. Only grace and operating in grace, true biblical grace, brings unity. Only that, unity. It comes from nowhere else. It comes from God's grace. But that means rightly relating to the Spirit of God. That's what it means. It means rightly relating to the Spirit of God. Now, grace gives unity. Now, I want to talk about unity for just a moment. Unity requires two things. Two things. Mark them down. Unity demands, requires two things. Being convicted about the person of Christ. Being convicted. That means I know the truth. Jesus is who he says he is. And anything other than that, like Paul said, let that man, let that person, let that teaching be accursed. There's no argument about who Jesus is. He is the Son of God and He is the Savior of all men who will turn to Him. The second thing is not just conviction about the purpose of Christ, but it is conviction and commitment to the purpose of Christ. The purpose of Christ. You see, everybody can believe in Jesus and say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I don't like this or I I don't like that, or I think we'll do this, or I think we'll do that. All of us have our opinions, except God. God does not have an opinion. God has truth. And we have to be committed uh, to the purpose of Christ. Now, I won't go into the purpose of Christ. Most of you understand what I'm saying already. But we need to examine ourselves and see Am I following the Spirit? Is He leading me into unity? Am I arguing about the person of Christ? If so, I'm wrong. If I'm arguing about the purpose of Christ, then so I'm wrong. And that's where unity comes from. And that only comes by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, Galatians is about the person of Christ. That's why Paul said, it's all about Jesus. You walk away from Him. You turn away from Him. You turn away from his leading, and guess what? We'd be accursed. Accursed in our life, even as believers. We cannot receive the full blessing of God. A church can, a people can, a nation can. And so that's important. Another thing is that Ephesians is about commitment. Commit. Not only committed to the person, but committed to the purpose of Christ. It's about commitment to his purpose. And that's why Galatians and Ephesians are inseparably, inseparably linked. You can't separate the two of those. Do not read Ephesians without reading Galatians. Galatians is connected, as all of the scripture is, but very much so with uh, Ephesians and Galatians. Galatians and Ephesians. You say, well, what is grace? Grace came from God's eternal counsel. God's counsel from all of eternity. You see, before time began, God decreed, he already mapped out the plan of salvation from first to last. And he decided that he was going to have a people for his own. And he made that possible. Now, it's also man's condition from Eden has to be considered because there and from there, from Adam 
and because of Adam and because of sin and then because of every man's sin, we're spiritually dead. Left to ourselves, we would never choose God's way. God enables people to respond freely to the grace that He's given us in the Lord Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Why? Because He's wanting to lead us into learning about grace. God's grace to save us, to keep us, and to live by in our lives. That's what He's after. That's what He's trying to teach every one of us. And then, grace is about God's commitment for everyday life. And that's what I want to focus on today. The Holy Spirit allows us to live in grace today. In grace today. Now, what I would do is I would say to each one of us, we need to do a study on graciousness and on what the Bible says about grace and graciousness as brothers and sisters in Christ. That is very vital because it tells us whether or not, whether or not we are living by grace through the Spirit. Now, with the adoption of the 13th Amendment, slavery was legally abolished. And that word went out all across America. That the slaves were officially set free. But it was on New Year's Day, 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was made public. But it was not until December of 1865 that it was made into law. Now, when that happened, what happened? Word began to sweep all the way from Capitol Hill down to the valleys of Virginia, down the back roads of the Carolinas, into the plantations of Georgia, all the way back to the back bayous of Louisiana, echoing off the cypress swamps down there. And what did it say? It says the slaves have been set free. Oh, should be a great shout of triumph, but it's not triumph for many. You see, it's a tragedy. A tragedy because a war had been fought, an amendment to the Constitution was now law, and men and women that were once enslaved and sold as property, they were set free. They were legally emancipated, freed. Yet, amazingly, many continued to live in fear, squalor, and slavery. Shelby Foote, he wrote the great monumental work on the Civil War. Listen to what he said. He said that slaves remain locked in a caste system of race etiquette as rigid as any he had known in formal bondage. Every slave could repeat with equal validity what an Alabama slave had said in 1864 when he asked what he thought of the great emancipator whose proclamation went into effect that year. And he said, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln, except that he said, they said he set us free. And I don't know nothing about that. Many people, believers, believers, we know the decree has been given to us, but we still choose to live in slavery. Why? In slavery to legalism, works, trying to please God, every way in the world other than grace, other than grace. Now, guess who loves that? Satan loves that. He loves it. He loves it when we go from grace back into legalism and law and works and our effort. You know what we ought to give our effort to? Lead me, Lord. I surrender to the Spirit. God, help me to put all of this aside, whatever's going on, and let me surrender to your Spirit. And that's how we're able to live in grace. We can't live in grace any other way, and we won't be gracious people any other way if we're not living under control of the Spirit. Now, you see, God stated his proclamation of emancipation. The moment the shackles were snapped on man. By sin, they are in the Garden of Eden. And now all down every generation, every man still wears those chains until we're set free by receiving the salvation that he's given us. 
and, it, and receiving and believing that he has promised that he would keep us for all of eternity here on earth and in eternity. God is going to keep everyone who has come to his son. But the question is not that. The question is, are we still living in slavery? You see, God declared his intent for men in the garden. There in Genesis 3.15, just read it. He declared his intent that the day was going to come and he was going to break the yoke of slavery and break the shackles and set men free. And it was decreed again at Golgotha. And it was decreed again by means of the resurrection. The great grace of God that we've been given. Do not, do not, do not exchange it for law, legalism, my strength, my power, my words. Well, you see, when we do that, our old slave master, Satan, he loves it. When after being saved by grace, he loves it to say, no, you're still a slave, and we buy that. But do you know how to defeat that slave master of old? Not our owner now, but the old slave master. And his mentality, his intent never changes. It's when he comes to us and does battle with us. We declare, we declare by grace. By grace, it is finished. I will live by the grace that I've been given. I'll not lay it down. I'm not exchanging for anything else. I will live by the grace that he has given. Grace to live by. You see, the Holy Spirit, the Bible is very clear all of the way through in the book of Galatians in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit leads us to liberty and warns against the slave mentality. He warns against. God warns us over and over again on almost every page of the Bible against the slave mentality in our lives. Let me tell you what legalism will do. It will lead us into iniquity. That's what it will do. It's iniquity when we forsake the gospel to begin with. And when we forsake the gospel, what happens? Iniquity comes into our lives. Both in mentality and our activity. And so it's very important that we learn to live by grace. The grace that we've been given. Wasn't it wonderful the time that you listened to the voice of God and the Spirit of God and you accepted God's grace. Accepted Jesus. Wasn't that wonderful? Well, it's even wonderful when we come once again and say, God, I accept the grace that you gave me in salvation and keeping me. But God, today I come and I accept the grace. I've walked away. I've forgotten it. I accept the grace that you give me to live by every day, this day. I accept your grace, God. And that grace is not something that just happens. When we come in accordance and in obedience with the Holy Spirit of God, He gives us that grace and He performs that work more in our lives. And He leads us to what? Liberty, not iniquity. He leads us to freedom, not activity, not at all. Let's do a comparison for just a moment between the law and grace. The law. It was given by who? By who? Moses. Ultimately God, yes. But Moses, it came through Moses. Grace and truth came by who? Jesus. Grace and truth came by Jesus. The law says, do this and you will live. Grace says, live, and then you will do. The law says, pay me what you owe me. Grace says, I forgive you of all debt paid in full. The law says, make you a new heart and a new spirit. Grace says, a new heart I will give you. And a new spirit I will put within you. The law demands holiness. Grace demands uh, or gives holiness. It doesn't demand it. The law says, condemn him. Grace says, embrace him. Embrace him just as a father embraced the prodigal. God does that every day 
we will walk by the Spirit and revel in the grace that He's given us. How many of you remember the movie with James Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life? I've only seen it however long I've been alive, every year at least. And I think most everybody has. But do you remember a guy in that movie? An angel named Clarence. What's he doing? Working, 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 doing anything, anything, everything that he can to do what? To earn his favor, his wings with God. And many times, we're clarities. We're clarities. We waste our grace when we begin to believe that we must please God by our performance or by our works. God's saying, I'm already pleased with you when you come to my son. I'll give you the grace to live by now. Listen to what Richard Newhouse said. He said, the moralizing and legalizing of the gospel of God's grace is a heresy held to disappoint people who are angry because they've not received what they had no good reason to expect. They know nothing of God. They don't expect, even if they come to Christ by His grace, to be able to live by grace. God empowers us to live by grace. You see, when grace is our only claim, who gets the glory? Who gets the glory when grace is our only claim? The Lord Jesus, you better believe it. The one who went to the cross, the one who paid the price for our sin, the one who rose from the dead, the one who ascended to the Father, accepted by the Father, accepted by God, accepted. Now you begin to understand, I hope, why Satan works so hard to tarnish this thing called grace, to attack this great absolute truth. Why? Because, you know what? It leads to a do-it-yourself, you get the glory, we get the glory. That's what it leads to. It turns into that kind of religion rather than a relationship. And it turns us rather than being the saints that have been set free and that are living by grace, kept by grace, and able to live by grace, it turns the saints into slaves once again. So the next time I speak, you speak, we speak, the next thing I do, you do. You know what? We need to ask, oh Spirit, is this of grace? Is this of grace? Put up Matthew 23, 4, please. Matthew 23, 4. I want to give you the definition of a legalist. Somebody who's always focused on this detail, that detail, it has to be this way, that way, you know. A legalist. A legalist is someone who takes great pains and passes them on to others. A legalist is someone who takes great pains and passes them on to others. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 4. He's talking about the Pharisees and their legalism. Their law, it's all about the law. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them to remove the burden with so much as a finger. But they do their deeds to be noticed by men. That's where legalism leads. That's where it leads to. It leads to slavery again. The great violin is Ruben Ock. After a concert that he had performed, he received an invitation from a man who was uh, in love with violins and violin music. And he invited uh, Rubinoff to go to a restaurant with him and have a meal with him. And he accepted. And when they got there, the man came in carrying a case. And they had lunch, had dinner. After they did that, then the man presented this case and he opened it up. And he showed it to Rubinoff, and he showed him what was in it. And what was in it was a Stradivarius violin. 
and he gave it to him. It was made in 1734, one of the three great Stradivarius uh, violins of today, still. And Rubinoff sat there with his mouth open and he said to him, Sir, Sir, why would you give me this? Why would you give me this vast fortune? Why? And the man answered Rubinoff and he said, I want to hear it sing again. It's been silent too long. I want to hear it sing again. It's been silent too long. Now let me share the truth with you. The truth is, grace puts back the song of life in us again. Grace gives, once again, a song of life to us. You want to, you want to lose your song? You want to lose your joy? I can tell you how we all do it. When we turn to legalism, God, i got to please you by doing this, doing that, and it's got to be this way and no other way, and that steals our song, and we live without joy in our lives. But turn to grace. Believing it all, we've been saved by grace. God, I've been saved by grace. Lord, I've been kept by your grace. I can't take all of that in. It's more than my mind can, can take in. It wobbles me, but yet I know it's true. But what about living by grace? God, I'm going to live by grace. And guess what? When we decide that's the way we're going to live, God puts a song back in our lives. So don't forget this tacit of grace. Because we have grace to live by. And it's very, very important. Let me read something to you, an old prayer. Old prayer. This is what it says. It says... Grace gives us, a, God give us grace to see our need of grace. God give us grace to ask for grace. God give us grace to receive grace. And God give us grace to use the grace that we have received. What a prayer. What a prayer. So maybe today that you know about this yoke that's on your neck, in your heart, in your mind. And you're wondering how in the world I know I'm saved. I believe God, but I don't know why that's there. I'm telling you the Spirit of God once again will break that yoke. Not the yoke of being lost, but the yoke of not being able to live with a song in your life. He will break that yoke and he'll set you free. Living by grace. Even as a Christian, we can live in slavery. But God is saying that you're free, you're free. So let's pray. God, as we come today, what can we say? Overwhelmed by your goodness to love. Father, I'm able to do anything. that can explain it or extol it in its fullness. We find our tongues are limited. God, our mind is limited when it comes to this, this thing, this great monumental thing you've done called grace and emancipated us. Now, Lord, I come and I know that we all struggle every day with things in our lives and some of those things are habits that we've gotten into without even recognizing <laughs> and we know that our song is not as strong as it was when we came to you to begin with now God if that's true in anyone's life here today I pray God that you would just very simply oh God please let them listen to the spirit and be set free again today now God I come and I Pray for those that are lost, that have never experienced anything about your grace. And ask God that you would bless them, that you would draw them today, Lord, to the knowledge of their slavery, their lostness. And God, that you point them to Jesus, the one who is grace. And that they will receive him as their Savior. And you put a song in their lives like they've never heard before. And ask in Jesus. Amen. It may be today that you simply want to come to the altar and pray. Whatever God is leading you to do. But there are those, and I know, I don't know who you are, I don't have any idea. 
But I know because I know that I get there many times. Living in works and legalism without even recognizing it's an easy thing to go back to. It's the old nature inside of us. Once again, trying to please God by our God. And it may be today that you say, God, I confess that. And I ask you to forgive me of that and put the song back in my life. The song of grace. Won't you come?